Again, I must remind you that while all of this is going on, Marco is very introspective and is trying to come to grips with his situation. Would he kill his mother if he had to? What would happen to his dad if he died? Why is everything so crazy? This all accumulates into a scene where he decides to practice his hammerhead morph in the school pool. Some bullies show up just as Marco is beginning his morph, and they just happen to be the most unimaginative bullies ever as they go straight to making fun of Marco for having a dead mom. Ah, taking the Pet Cemetery 2 approach, are we? Well, now isn't the best time to do this to Marco, because while he might not look sharky on the outside, the shark brain is starting to creep in. I can see the arteries there, the ones that were pulsating on either side of Wu's Adam's apple. Jake comes in just in time to cool Marco down, but it was a tense scene. Once again, Marco comes off as not only the most intelligent of the Animorphs, but also the most dangerous. If Marco wasn't a good guy, he'd make a great serial killer. The next morning, the Animorphs all morph hammerheads and make their way back to the underwater base. Indeed, the other hammerheads don't attack, so the Animorphs slip past security and enter the base through the hammerhead doggy door. Inside, they end up corralled into a hammerhead assembly line and are picked up by machines, take a drill to the head, get injected with something in the brain, and are then let go. Freaked out, the Animorphs regroup in a hammerhead tank and decide to demorph in a tank full of things that will kill you if you're not a hammerhead. But nothing happens, and they decide to morph insects to scout the base out. But as they get smaller, they realize that there's now a chip in their head, and it's not morphing with them. So morphing something as small as a fly will literally cause their heads to explode. That seems odd at first. I mean, they can morph skin-tight clothing, and you really don't get more skin-tight than inside you. But unlike the dolphin not ge going into a trance earlier, at least this detail of metal things inside you not morphing with you remains consistent throughout the series. The Animorphs conclude that the Yerks are modifying the brains of the hammerhead sharks to allow the Yerks to enter which are probably the best creatures you can have for trying to take over an underwater civilization like the Lyrans by force. I mean, taxons can swim, but you can kill a taxon with a nail file. As Marco puts it, this is probably the closest thing to underwater Horkbegir. So priority one is finding a way to get the chips out of their heads. So Jake, Rachel, and Cassie morph battle morphs to cause a distraction, while Axe, the one who knows Yerk technology, Marco, the smartest of the five humans, and Tobias, the cheapskate who doesn't have a combat morph, sneak into the administrative area of the base to try and find some answers. Marco ends up getting separated from the other two and somehow ends up in Visor One's office, which leads to the best scene in the entire book, where Visor One confuses Marco as a controller. We're having a bit of a problem with the Andalite bandits. Visor Three has still failed to exterminate, Visor One said calmly. All I could do was nod. I see, she said. Obviously your host mind is giving you some trouble. I'm sure you are aware that your host body is the biological son of my own host body. Not a shred of emotion. Not a shred of guilt. It was sitting there, using my mother's body. Knowing. Knowing like no one else could possibly know the agony my mother must be feeling at seeing me. I nodded. Yes, Vizier. You must learn to control your host more completely. My own host is in here creating an awful racket, she said, tapping her head. But I do not let her weeping and wailing disturb me. No, Vizier, I said in a whisper. I will try harder to control my host. I wanted to destroy that yerk. I wanted to reach inside that familiar head and rip that filthy yerk out of there and stomp it into the floor. I was surprised Vizier 1 couldn't see my hate. I felt it vibrating the very air around me. But I couldn't do anything. All I could do was stand there. Stand there with my arms at my sides and listen to the foul Yerk Vizier, highest of all the Vizier, sneer at the fact that my mother's mind and heart were crying from seeing her son made a slave of the Yerks. Pretty intense stuff. So Marco leaves and hooks up with the other two. They discover a Yerk computer that Axe manages to hack into, and discover that the chips in their heads will liquefy if the base is destroyed. Because liquid metal in the brain can only be a good thing, right? Marco decides that they need to bust a hole in this place and let the water pressure do the rest of the work. So Axe sets a self-destruct thing for a five-minute timer, Marco morphs Gorilla, and they join the fight with the rest of the group. 
That's when Visitor 3 shows up, and no, this doesn't warrant a he's always there joke, because Visitor 3 visiting a Yerk base that houses his superior actually makes sense. He's morphed into the form of a giant aquatic alien snake, which I guess aren't as good as invading water planets as hammerhead sharks, I don't know. Visitor 1 joins the fray, as does a rare Liren controller, who identifies Marco as human, but there's a misunderstanding and Visitor 1 doesn't get the memo. Instead, Visitor 1 Rikes walks right up to giant evil snake Visitor 3, and the two start bitching at each other, which just shows how much confidence Visitor 1 has in her power. I don't know. If I was a manager, I wouldn't complain about my co-manager's performance if he was a giant evil space snake. That's when the warning for containment failure starts going off, so Visitor 1 tries to get to the computers to fix the mess while the Animorphs duke it out with evil space snake Visitor 3. One notable thing that happens in this conflict is that it marks the first time the human Animorphs have directly communicated with Visitor 3, showing that they're just a little more confident in their abilities. Marco knocks Visitor 3 unconscious, while Visitor 1 successfully stops the timer. Rachel is about to take her head off when, No! I yelled. Rachel swiveled her head and stared at me with nearsighted bare eyes. Shut up, Marco! I said no! Don't do it! She's a Yerk Visitor, Axe pointed out calmly. No, I said again. She's my mother. So, yeah, awkward. Visitor 1 tries to take a pot shot at Rachel, but Marco throws a chair at her, which misses and instead hits a window, breaking it and starting the whole base deconstruction thing. So all this brouhaha about computer decryptions and timers and all that, and all you needed to do was break a window? Huh. So the Animorphs escape as the base floods. The last we see of Visitor 1 is her unconscious, face down in the water, as the Lirin from earlier approaches her. Did she survive? What about the Lirin who knows Marco's true identity? What'll come of that? And how will the Yerk's invasion of the Lirin's homeworld affect the war on Earth? And how many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? Post book follow up. I want to return to a line from Marco's personal encounter with Visitor 1. You must learn to control your host more completely. My own host is in here creating an awful racket, she said, tapping her head, but I do not let her weeping and wailing disturb me. Okay, now consider what a human controller actually is. Theory time. A person with a visage of normality on the outside, but suffering great emotional turmoil on the inside. Turmoil they cannot escape from. All throughout the book, Marco is secretly containing great emotional turmoil, but refuses to let it out. He tries to keep up the image of a smart, alecky, fun guy throughout the book, while we readers are more aware of his depressed inner state. Marco may not have an alien slug in his head, but the parallels are obvious. If we keep along these lines, you could almost consider the Yerks partially a metaphor of how withholding emotions can change a person. Consider when Jake's brother Tom became a controller, the Yerk made him quit basketball, a sport he was super passionate in. The secret of being a controller suppressing passion. When Marco learned Visitor 1's identity, he decided to hide it from the rest of the group, and consequently became more willing to participate and became deceptively cheerful and goofy. The secret of Visitor 1's identity forced him to suppress his anguish. I'm not exactly saying Marco is a figurative controller, just that the withholding of these emotions changed him far more than if he had shared his troubles in the first place. Really, revealing that Visitor 1 was his mother at the end of the book was the best thing that could have happened to him. This book is, uh, mostly awesome. Visitor 1's return was handled well, and we get a good glimpse at the much bigger picture of the Yerk invasion, that it doesn't just include Earth, but several other planets at the same time. The introduction of the Lirin bring a level of dread to the situation. Whatever's going on in the Lirin homeworld, the Anwars do not want the Yerks to win. If more Lirins show up, Kiss the Anmorphs goodbye, people. Only a few things drag this down. Once again, we have a opening bit that has nothing to do with anything, and the chase in the aquarium up in Marco, up to Marco's showdown with the shark was uh, pretty damn stupid. Oh, and because loyal viewer and commenter Mr. H37 is going to call me on this, yes, this is a water book I like, okay? You happy? So yeah, three awesome Marco books in a row. Now let's see if Jake can get one. Anyway, I give Mar Animorphs number 15, The Escape, a 9 out of 10.